Hi, everyone. Um, really excited to be here, so thanks for attending. Um, you know, as we move to distributed work, we really have unmatched opportunities in front of us, you know, for better, um, you know, innovation, collaboration, and connection with each other. But, you know, too often we're frozen by not approaching this with an agile mindset, especially right now when there are just so many unknowns in front of us. So, um, just want to talk a little bit today about we can, you know, create these pathways for creating excellent excellence within our teams um, and just giving them the room and the space to define things. So we know we just experienced probably one of the most dramatic and immediate changes in work that we've ever seen. And, you know, overnight people, you know, we locked the doors, people were sent home, we closed the office. And that anchor that we'd held on to for so long, you know, even, even for people that had a somewhat flexible work, um, you know, um, Ability still, we had that anchor and that was taken away from us. And, you know, we just had to figure it out really quickly and without any guidance. How are we going to work together going forward? And, you know, a lot of times this was, you know, in varying personal circumstances as well. And, you know, we really just had no precedent for this, no policies, leadership didn't know what to do. Um, there was no playbook, but teams, they reacted quickly. And, you know, they tried things and they adapted to change and they figured things out as they went along. And, you know, it's really, I think, important to note that it was the teams and the individuals that were driving this for the most part, not necessarily leadership. And, you know, even now teams are more in the driver's seat, I think, for defining the paths and helping to create these policies than they ever have been before. And though we're still really all figuring it out as we go. So just really quick poll. Um, I know things are changing fast here, but anyone here going into the office every single day? No work from home at all? No? No one? Anyone 100% remote? So there is no sort of physical office per se. And hybrid, some sort of mix, most people. Yeah, so we're seeing really just such a huge range of experiences right now. Um, you know, no one person is the same as the other. And there's a lot of debate about the future of work. And really strong opinions, I'd say, on both sides, you know, and, you know, we're not really here to just say what approach is better than the other, you know, but we're still trying to figure out things like, you know, how do we keep the best parts of that in-office physical in-person experience that we like, um, but still have all the flexibility and things that we enjoy from having, you know, sort of more, um, you know, abilities to do as we need to do. And we know a mix of options are going to continue to exist. But the reality is there are a lot of amazing opportunities, you know, undeniably um, about this change that we've seen. Work-life flexibility, so um, hopefully we're all getting some time to spend with family and friends, um, maybe even carving out, you know, a little bit of personal time to take after or uh, look after ourselves as well. And overwhelmingly right now, people are saying, despite all the challenges, that, you know, workers want to work remotely or flexibly. I think 80% is what a lot of the surveys are saying right now. And it's not just the, the individuals, it's the companies as well that are reaping the benefits. Lowered costs, reduced office space, you know, we've got access to a global talent pool, which is diversifying our, works, our workforce. And we know that sparks new ideas, bringing new perspectives, um, and ultimately just betters everything that we're doing. And of course, you know, this amazing positive impact this is going to have on the environment by reducing travel and commutes. But, um, you know, there are lots of challenges, too, and we know it's a complicated problem. So what do we do? And some companies are sort of like pushing headlong into this, you know, boldly to, to define what we're going to do as we move forward. And some are a little bit more cautious. And others yet, you know, like some companies are, are giving really high level guidance, but otherwise just kind of letting teams do what they need to do to figure things out. Um, I think Atlassian is a really good example of that. They turn to a work from anywhere policy. They don't care where you work from and when, but you just need to reside in a country where they've got, you know, legal entity. But other than that, it's completely up to you. And if you're doing business with them as well, you know, I think it's worth noting that you kind of have to work with their policies in, in that way as well. So I think, you know, we can actually use this disruption that we've seen and the removal of, of, of workforce norms and use this as the trigger 
to create better virtual collaboration than we ever had before and start creating those human connections that we really need. So the question really is, so how do we embrace this opportunity? So an important thing to consider is our stakeholders. Um, you know, some companies are thinking about policy from the company point of view, the bottom line, and what do we need to get done? But other companies are looking at the teams and the individuals and thinking about what do they need? And you know, not just their, their uh, team members, but their clients, partners, vendors, their families. You know, how can we address all of these needs and um, making sure that we're taking them into account as well? And we also need to think about the design of our current tools, which you know, are great and have gotten us you know, this far, but um, they haven't really been designed necessarily for this, this future of work that we're, we're living right now. And um, we know that with any major change, technology has played a critical role. You know, like, um, and you know, if, if we rely on those same capabilities that we've been using for so long, then we might never re really realize the vision that we're trying to achieve. It's just really the time to explore. And I'll just take you, um, I've got it here, just an analogy, you know, your old sort of flip phone. And it was a really simple need that we needed to address. Like, I need to make and take phone calls when I'm on the go. I need to be able to leave my desk or my landline. And you know, the mobile phone really addressed this in a very simple way, taking a concept that we were familiar with. It was a phone, and you know, now you can leave the house with the phone. And beyond that, it kind of progressed to what else? You know, what else can we build into these devices to make our lives better? And now, you know, we can track our health data, we can find a partner, we can play games. Um, phones are used to sort of, you know, uh, we see uh, increased mobile broadband coverage is showing correlation with reduced poverty in some countries. We've got fin financial access. They're doing a lot more than they were originally intended to do. And thinking back to the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of teams, you know, they turn to things like Zoom which again was taking a really familiar concept that we were familiar with. It was a video call, you know, it was around for decades, World's Fair type of thing. And it just took that concept, put it online and voila, we've got a, an easy way of communicating with people virtually. But, but what else do we need um, beyond just communication? We really kind of need our meeting platforms to be smart as well. So going back to the iPhone, um, which uses visual um, information and uh, communication really well, and our brains love that, right? So, you know, a lot of the um, things that are happening right now in the technology space are, are built around visual collaboration. Um, Zoom just realized uh, recently they updated their whiteboard and they've connected it to Zoom rooms so they can start to blend the experience of in-office people and remote teams, and also to better visualize the work. Um, and then we've got these sort of immersive, immersive virtual spaces, which are really built to give everyone presence and being able to see the people around you and kind of feel the buzz of what's going on and feel part of a team no matter where you are. And then, of course, we've got um, all the major developments we're seeing with AR and VR, the metaverse, of course, and you know, creating these really immersive, rich worlds that, that feel real and they, they they stretch our imagination in terms of what, what you know, we think of as a workspace. So you can see there's enormous potential for just bringing people together in these really engaging experiences. And they're not about meetings anymore. Um, these are really thoughtfully designed experiences. And we'll see solutions you know, built on top of things like Zoom and Teams, again, with the virtual visual collaboration and your connected tools. And also, um, you know, how do we bring science to the workplace again? How do we start to measure employee engagement and not just satisfaction? How do we measure increased uh, creativity and, and true human connection? So it's a really exciting space for creators and consumers right now. And I think a key thing is that we need to allow teams room to explore these new technologies and see what, what do they need to fit their current needs and not necessarily lock them into you know, the software suites we've been using for ages that kind of fit then, but not necessarily now. So let's talk about some of these needs. So these are just a few of the things that we are hearing from employees and management, uh, community experts, um, things that people are finding really difficult right now. And 
I don't think any of these will be surprising to anyone, but meeting fatigue. I mean, there's one statistic that said it was 250% more meetings than we had pre-pandemic, which is madness. And it's, it, it's, it's just too easy now to quickly schedule a meeting. You click it, you accept it, and boom, you're there. And we'll see a lot of the innovation right now is going towards, you know, how do we shift some of these decision-making processes into, you know, outside of the meeting and make it more about high bandwidth, quick conversations with the right people at the right time. And people are just feeling, you know, they're feeling lonely, they're feeling disconnected. It's incredibly difficult to onboard new employees. You know, they're coming through the door and they don't have those interactions that are so uh, necessary. And then what do teams want? So they want to feel connected to other people. Um, they want to kind of, you know, be in touch with what's going on in the organization. And they also really want to let, let others know that they're there for them as well. You know, creating these opportunities for coaching, mentorship to unblock each other. And, you know, respect my way of working. This is a huge one because right now, as we are still figuring it out, we all have different, you know, we're in different time zones. We've got different ways of working, different ways of absorbing and communicating information. So, you know, teams, they, they know what they want to need. So how can we empower these teams to be able to continue to define things and make their own choices? And, you know, if, if we're doing that, then what is the role of leaders then, if not to be implementing these top-down policies? So first of all, you know, we really need to embrace uncertainty, uh, which is in abundance right now. And, you know, we all want a concrete plan or we think we want a concrete plan because it feels good. You know, it helps us feel prepared and less unsettled. But we know that the future is unpredictable and the policies that we're creating right now, you know, are probably led by assumptions. Um, and more than ever, being adaptive is just really critical. And also trusting the team to take this to the next level. Um, you know, the best designs come from self-organizing teams, right? And if we can provide that high-level guidance and then step to the side um, and let the teams take over, um, you know, asking them what, what are the small steps that we can take right now to improve things, make things a little bit better, and then what are the bolder experiments as well that we can start to try? And not being afraid to, you know, also toss out some of those things that we've held so near and dear that perhaps aren't really working anymore um, and just continue to reflect and improve. Also, um, encouraging learning loops, of course. Make sure that we're learning all along the way and we're sharing that learning with others, um, which can lead to building communities of practice. And um, this is actually something that we're doing at the company I'm with, Wilo, um, where we started to build these learning communities with our customers, um, with our partners, with community experts, um, with our uh, partnership with Atlassian and Zoom. Um, so we can start to share these learnings, design experiences based on methodologies and research and feedback and, and everyone else's learnings. Um, and everyone has a voice, which is so key and can contribute to, to kind of figuring things out. So really the opportunity as we see it here is just trusting our team, just like we did at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, and this is a learning loop as well. We saw this worked pretty well. <laughs> um, so we should continue to do this. And you know, let the people closest to the work figure things out, um, encourage experimentation and exploration, um, and just continue to learn, really. Um, and that's all I have. So thank you so much for your attention. Appreciate it. <laughs> Happy for some Q&A? Hi. Yeah, um, that's really interesting. Um, I wondered if you could I had thought you, you, you said about encouraging communities of learning. Mm -hmm. um, we do the same, we, we had that pre-pandemic, so we'd get in the meeting and have pizza. We tried to do that during the pandemic. But the thing that we found, and I wondered if you had some help on this or some observations, is that how do you stop that becoming another meeting? Yeah, that's, that's a really great one because we actually have honestly struggled a little bit of that, you know, with our company, even though this is what we're, we're trying to, you know, push forward. Um, what we've done, we've tried doing it with more selective groups um, so we can start to respect individuals' time um, and kind of look at the scheduling that way. 
Um, we make things opt-in as well, it's really important. But we've also um, made a lot of use of just communicating and um, visualizing the things that we're coming up with um, asynchronously as well. So we, um, we, we, you know, we work together in a virtual workspace and we've actually created rooms for these learnings and information so people can just kind of go in there, wander, and you know, check things out, read things, see graphs, stuff like that. Yeah. Anyone else? Just a comment on that one, I suppose, as well. Um, we, we, we work for a very large multinational insurance company, and mm -hmm. I guess the, the, the one thing that we have found with that is that we, we need to keep sharing because there's just, just everybody's distributed everywhere, and it's just a disaster trying to get people back together again. But what we've, we've spent a long time doing is making sure that they continue to talk and they come up with the topics themselves. If they nice. come up with the topics themselves, we don't force that, you just leave it. Yeah. Um, so it, it very much has to be humble and organic. Um, it, if it just doesn't happen, we just leave it for a week or a month or whatever when we try to re encourage it again. But the topics have to come from within rather than us as, as you know, senior management trying to push down and use those topics as well. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah, fantastic. Anyone else? Hi. I'm just wondering if there's any, <clears throat> anything in particular that's come out from what you've been doing that has particularly or worked in a surprising way. Yeah, actually, so I've been in sort of the virtual workspace game for 12 years, I think it's been now, and I think I was even one of the first ones. And it was all about kind of like get everyone into the space and make sure they log in every day and then you're there and then you can see others and then it'll start to build from there. And that often didn't happen, honestly. And because the thing is you can, you can provide these great tools and solutions to your teams um, and put all your weight behind it. And they can be great enablers, I mean, don't get me wrong, like it's really good enabled and infrastructure for that change, but you need other drivers for the change as well. So that was something that I was personally really surprised because I thought that was the end all be all solution for years. Um, and what we found actually is that letting teams come together for the stuff that mattered to them, um, you know, some of these sort of, you know, community events or for the, um, uh, even sometimes games and things, workshops, other more collaborative things, and letting them pick and choose what was most relevant and interesting to them. Actually, overall, the experience was better. Um, it had them using these solutions when they needed to, but they didn't kind of feel forced to, um, which, you know, sort of improved their collaboration altogether. More than a yeah. push. Uh, yeah, yeah, well put, exactly, okay. yeah. Yeah, so I, I mean, I actually work for the company Wheela. Um, so we, that, that one slide was an image of Wheela where it's a virtual workspace. Um, in addition to that, we use the Atlassian suite. Um, we've just started using Confluence. So we've, uh, many of our team members had not been using it previously. So that's been a bit of a journey, um, but we're getting there. Um, and we use all these and we use Slack, but we're trying to get away from that because we found it was just this sort of endless like noise in the background. So we're starting to pull away from that. Um, but the, um, we also uh, connect a lot of the, uh, our JIRA boys and things to the workspace itself, again, to kind of create those rooms, those where you can go in and you can um, see visual representations of the, the um, information. You can read it at your leisure when your time zone, et cetera. Um, and we found that's worked really well. Hi. One of the points you mentioned is challenges with not connecting with people outside of my immediate team. Mm. That's what I see between multiple teams in, in, in my, uh, my company, uh, where they haven't talked for possibly 18 months, and yet they, they would, you would see the natural conversations at the coffee machine. Or, or yeah. How do, you re how do you replace these in the, uh, in the new world? That's a great question, and I'm not really certain anyone's completely figured that out. And I know there are tools out there that can um, sort of give you prompts to connect with people, you know, like, hey, connect with Dave in marketing. You haven't seen him in six months. Here you are, you're in a virtual room together. Talk, make it happen. Um, sometimes those can work and sometimes not. Um, honestly, I'm not sure that there are any sort of uh, like software solutions or technology to address that. Um, so I don't really have a great answer for that, quite honestly. Um, what we've seen with some teams, they've done um, sort of more team building events. Again, completely optional. I think that seems to be the key, make them optional and make them um, 
you know, have, have many to choose from so people can pick and choose. And there has been some success with those with some of the customers we worked with. Yeah. <laughs> Choose yourself. Sorry. Do you yes. think that distributed has made people want to be more deliberate about team building, like team agreements, mm. a team canvas, um, a better onboarding process, um, and all these things, because they realize that it really matters more. Do you think that ultimately we'll get to a better state of appreciating the value of culture, rather than just saying you're in an office together, and by the way, you might talk at the, 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 the Coffee machine occasionally, which is obviously a bit ad hoc, but you think we've become a bit more aware of the importance of culture and then we're putting steps in place to make it make it happen more. Yeah, I, I love that point. Absolutely. I think so. I really do. I think I think we are thinking more than ever about, you know. What is you know what does my teammate need and what do they like and do, what do they prefer? Um, and that can only be a good thing, right? When we start to have empathy for others. So he's hoping. We're certainly planting things. I mean, I've seen the inside of people's bedrooms that would never. You know, <laughs> yeah, it's like completely open. You know, quite a lot of that going on. That's true. Maybe it's just that. Honestly, we see their dirty laundry in the background, and now we feel closer. Hey. I, I have a bit of a question, I guess. <clears throat> I see a bit of a contradiction uh, between things, especially because what you mentioned and you mentioned is we want to get back into this uh, coffee machine talk, uh, water cooler. But at the same time, like you mentioned, we're getting a lot of those tools like Slack because they are just getting mm. background noise. But that's not background noise. It's we're missing the interaction, so we're moving in there. But the companies are more and more cracking down. You know what? This is not being related. We don't need it. I'm pushing that responsibility of connection to the teams. Mm -hmm. How can we really reconcile these two things? We are, we are ask, you're asking us, we're trying to get that social part. And you're saying, yes, that's a lot, but sometimes not on company time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a yeah, great point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, because it's like, we have a Slack, yeah. but you cannot use it for chatting, you can use it for, you know, okay. it has to be work-related. Mm -hmm. And all of these tools that allow that are slowly being cracked down to get rid of those specs. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you're asking, well, you need to do you more, you need to come, why are you not talking with this other team? Why are you not doing something? And we try to do this like, well, yeah, but do it outside of work time. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I personally, I could think there are a lot of issues with that, you know, sort of dictating what people can use and how they could communicate what they can say. I mean, I personally think that's a mistake, but um, I think there's something, I guess what flashed in my head was, because I think you're right. I mean, Slack has a really great use, I think, for that just kind of like that banter. It's great for banter. And, and we're still using it for that. But what we found is we were trying to put like ideas and like, you know, actionable items and things and requests into here. And they were just, especially with time zones. I mean, I wake up in the morning and there's like a whole bunch of stuff from, from the US folks. So, um, so I, I don't know, maybe it's a matter of, you know, first of all, companies and leadership, like letting people use what, what's feeling good to them to a certain extent. I think the fellow earlier was talking about, there are some things that, that teams have to use, right? We have to have some standardization in some areas, but other things should be more flexible. Um, yeah, and then the second piece is maybe the right tool for the right job, you know? If, if information sharing should be here, but maybe some of that more social activity can be in something else. Well, thank you so much, thank you.